Fabulous to, uh, to have another uh, fantastic panel, our last one of the day, but one that has been obviously raising, rising in prominence considerably uh, around the impacts of nature and nature-related risk, and an absolutely fabulous uh, panel to share insights with. So, um, Peniel, over to you to take it forward from here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this last session today on nature and nature-related risks. Um, Fifteen years ago, I was, or someone rather, accused me of being a tree hugger. <laughs> and I'm a bit ashamed to say that I think I may have felt it was sort of an insult, and I defensively said, no, I'm not. And then I realized that today I would have said, I am a tree hugger. I would have been proud of it. <laughs> And I think that said actually something about, maybe about me becoming more confident, but also about society's view on nature as uh, being quite different. This is something like I said 15 years ago. Um, so we're here to talk about nature in this session. Um, but before that, and before we get to the two very interesting presentations, I'd like to just read out something I read from in an article last week on the Mekong Delta uh, in Vietnam. It says, by building a network of irrigation canals for rice farming, Constructing upstream dams and mining the river sand, humans have reshaped nearly every inch of the delta, altering the movement and, of water and sediment. As a result, the delta has seen catastrophic flooding, land subsidence, and crumbling roads. Um, it happens in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. It happens in so many other places around the world. For about 300 years or so, we have been trying to dominate nature, so humans have been trying to dominate nature, it hasn't worked. I think we see the problems today um, uh, related to nature are a result of that, partly. Uh, the thing is, nature is obviously much cleverer than us, and we need nature so much more than nature needs us. So the whole um, global economy, which I see sort of as this large steamship, we're trying to change that, but it's difficult to do that. But what might help us move this large moving vessel in the right direction could be, uh, or at least part of the solution will be data and analytics, and that's why we're here today to talk about that. Um, we, the program consists of two presentations. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll open the floor to Q&A. Uh, first, Jimena Alvarez will be presenting on, on the uh, impact of nature risk on the UK financial institutions in a report many of you, I'm sure, will have seen. I've seen it, I've read it, it's super, super interesting. Jimena is a research associate in resilience systems and the environment at the University of Oxford. Over to you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you, Bernil, for the introduction. So um, I'm delighted to be presenting our work on assessing the materiality of nature-related risks to UK financial institutions. The report was uh, launched over a month ago, and in a nutshell, it demonstrates that biodiversity loss and environmental degradation create demonstrably material risks to the UK economy and the financial sector, in addition to wider societal impacts. And these impacts are near and present, so um, the way I've structured the presentation is to provide some context and then deep dive a bit on some of the key results. But before I start, um, why do, did we do this analysis? So um, UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world and it's not on track to meet the targets um, of the Convention on Biodiversity, um, Biological Diversity, nor its um, commitments and environmental protection um, environmental, sorry, and uh, the issue is that this poses local risks. But in turn, the UK economy and the financial sector are exposed to um, international risks through supply chain and um, the connections between the economy and the financial system. So this represents global risks as well. So when we look at physical and transition risks to UK firms and um, financial institutions, we don't have a quantification of these risks to date before this report. And in addition, there's a lot of, there has been great work on, on climate risk and climate interacts with nature. And if we're not considering the disintegration and the feedbacks, we are um, locking in systemic risk. So um, several financial institutions have um, introduced nature-related disclosures and risk management strategies. And the UK has been falling behind others like the European Central Bank, the Dutch Central Bank, and Bank de France. 
So when we look at the urgency around assessing nature-related financial risk, we cannot really not mention IPBES. IPBES is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the sister um, organization to the IPCC for climate. And um, the 2019 Global Assessment Report shows that when we look at the nature contributions to people, well, we have a, a, an excerpt here, which is analogous to ecosystem services in concept, um, 14 out of 18 have declined since the 1970s, whilst outputs for food and other products have risen. So when we look at drivers of these environmental degradation, things like climate change, pollution, invasive species, and extraction need to be uh, considered. So another um, relevant example is the planetary boundaries framework and this um, progression on how many boundaries have been breached since 2009 also points to the urgency from three crossed over to four in 2015 and then six in 2023. Um, one of the things we did in this report is develop this UK nature related risk inventory, which is complementary to the UK national security risk assessment and the UK climate change risk assessment, in that it offers an expanded set of nature related risks and includes chronic and long term risks as well as acute event driven risks. It's the first of its kind, and we think of it as a live tool that can be complementary to other tools. And you can see here um, a map, map of 29 different risks, which include physical risks, as well as um, litigation and transition risks. And if you look at the likelihood and impact which we assessed over um, this risk, if you go to the high uh, right-hand side, you would see things like global food security repercussions, soil health decline, zoonotic disease or antimicrobial resistance. We also um, included a dependencies analysis using the ENCORE tool and multi-regional input output tables. And our results show that um, 930 billion of UK bank and insurer financial assets are at least moderately directly depending on nature and ecosystem services. But if we look at how these assets are mapped to um, supply chains, these depend on much more uh, bigger scope of assets. And it, doing that third order dependency analysis, including uh, supply chains, shows that 56% of the total upstream exposure are highly or very highly dependent on nature. Another thing we did is calculate the nature value at risk, which is in the hundreds of billions of um, Great British Pounds. And we looked at 18 ecosystem services and we um, did an analysis at the sector level. So what this graph shows is that um, risk related to water scarcity alone would be around 300 billion. And if we look at, say, climate regulation, we're around 250 billion. In terms of sectors, um, the economic output effect would be largest in the agricultural sector, but in terms of monetary terms, the services and the manufacturing sectors would be exposed the most. And importantly, around half of the UK nature-related risk comes from abroad, which is um, important to um, incorporate into our thinking, and I'll touch on it in a, in a few slides. So we also analysed how the seven largest UK banks' uh, portfolios um, are exposed and where um, we can pinpoint where the risks are coming from in terms of locations and sectors and uh, for different ecosystem services. So green here would be the UK, but um, you, depending on the bank portfolio, you will have more or less international exposure. Uh, I think that got a lot of um, media coverage uh, is our analysis on GDP um, impacts. So we coupled with the National Institute for Economic Social Research and we used the NIGEM model which has been used by the NGFS to quantify scenarios we develop. We develop three scenarios, a domestic scenario, an international scenario, and an anti, um, an antimicrobial resistance and, and pandemic scenario. And we projected uh, GDP impacts of 6% lower than um, would have been otherwise for the domestic and health, uh, I'm sorry, and international scenario and rising to 12% for the health scenario. And these, to provide some perspective, these would be bigger than the shocks from the global financial crisis, which was around 5, 6% in the UK, or COVID-19, which was around 11% um, loss in 2020. 
um, the the big um, one of the biggest conclusions is that nature would double climate losses. So these, um, when we look at gradual, chronic, year-to-year -year environmental degradation, um, say air pollution or global deforestation, these uh, our results show that it would be as detrimental or more so than climate change. Um, this means that nature-related risks are doubling the scale of physical climate-related risks, which um, estimated by the NGFS, and. In addition, nature amplifies climate risks and compounds um, in turn as well. So we show that um, the, these results are macrocritical, but that it, this also has um, implications for adaptation. So um, adaptation and nature are aligned, and we need to incorporate them into risk assessment and disclosure, as well as uh, transition plans. And um, we, we did a lot of co-development as part of this work, which I think was very helpful, hopefully, to both parties and um, to drive the conversation forward in how to develop what's needed in terms of tools, analytics, and data. And I think in the panel, we'll cover a bit more of that. Um, in terms of um, financial stress tests, we also developed the first nature um, independent aggregated financial stress test for nature based on publicly available data and looking across the portfolios of uh, seven of the UK largest banks, the analysis shows that um, near-term adjustments in loan values in the short term, so 2028, would be around 4 to 5% depending on the bank. Uh, but it could be as high as 9% when we um, look at the agriculture sector in the domestic scenario. And climate change is purely, purely nature, so climate change would um, amplify this risk further, which is why we think these uh, results are conservative. Um, in terms of implications, uh, and a, a bit of um, an excerpt, so there's this urgency around assessing nature-related risks because it's falling through the gaps in current financial and fiscal policies and regulation. So we need to develop uh, policies, tools, frameworks to, to close this gap. The evidence is clear that this is happening, and that, that means the systemic risks are accumulating, and finance is contributing to this flow being unhindered by the misalignment of capital flows. Um, the, the good news would be that unlike climate, there, um, there are sizably ways of reducing the risk by um, transitioning early, early and orderly towards a nature positive and net zero resilient economy, both in the UK and globally, given that half of the risk would come from abroad. Um, and acting now could result in um, almost immediate benefits for firms, so there's no lag effect, unlike in the case of climate. Um, this also strengthens the need to protect and restore nature and be, um, meet the goals of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And we encourage firms to begin to assess risk and build this strategy and, and nature transition plans in integrating nature with emerging climate and regulatory frameworks. Um, so at the core, what we, we think is needed is um, a paradigm shift, which brings nature at the core of risk um, assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jimena. Um, uh, our next presenter is Jenny Ramos. She will be speaking to us about directors' liability for nature risk. Jenny is a lawyer with the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative. Over to you. Okay, so we've heard from Jimena how the Green Finance Institute report clarified the financial materiality of nature-related risks in the UK. And now we're going to look at the legal relevance. And please bear with me. I know maybe you find law boring. It's only 10 minutes and it is very relevant. So, so bear with me. Um, we're going to look at what the legal duties of company directors in relation to nature-related risks are. And also, why is this relevant to financial institutions looking for data to assess their nature-related financial risks? So in March, Pollination and the CCLI, the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, jointly commissioned a landmark legal opinion that clarified the relevance of nature-related risks to the duties of company directors. And just to clarify, this was on nature-related risk, but nature does encompass climate, so it covers both. 
The expert team of company and financial law barristers clarified that nature-related risks arise from companies' impacts and dependencies on nature. They emphasise that these are not new risks, but drivers of existing categories of financial risks. And we've just seen from the report that Jimena presented why this is really material. They found that these dependencies and impacts on nature are capable of affecting a wide range of English companies. The nature-related risks that stem from this are relevant to the short and long-term success of companies. They can have significant effects on a company's ability to operate successfully and are capable of causing a variety of types of harm to a company, which in some cases could be highly damaging or even existential for the company. Therefore, such risks are relevant to the role and function of a company's board and to director's duties under the UK Companies Act. So board directors that do not appropriately consider such risks may face consequences for breaching their duties. The opinion said, the risk that directors will be challenged in respect of alleged failures to identify and manage nature-related risks have never been higher. So directors have a duty to promote the success of the company under company's law, and also a duty to exercise reasonable care, skill, and diligence. How do directors discharge their duties? The opinion recommends that directors identify and consider the extent to which the company faces nature-related risks, ensuring that these are appropriately assessed and evaluated. They should then also take steps to manage and mitigate these risks where appropriate, and consider which of those might need to be disclosed under existing disclosure regulations. The barristers emphasise the need for active consideration of nature-related risks, false or inadequate consideration of these issues, you know, potential greenwashing could expose the company to latent financial risks arising from unaddressed nature-related impacts and dependencies, the risk of shareholder claims, and also reputational risk. So we've talked a lot about today about the need for policy and regulation and, and the fact that maybe it's not there yet. We're talking here about law, companies' laws that are already there that are telling us that directors need to do this. So some of the legislation is already there, and this is a potentially impactful lever to use. So why is this relevant for the financial sector? Why do they care what directors' duties are? Um, you know, many financial organisations are already aware of the risks and they're already asking companies for information. But some of these financial sector players will be companies themselves, so their boards will need to consider their duties in this light. But here I'm speaking mainly in terms of the relationships with portfolio companies in the real economy. So firstly, there is a common misconception that companies need to wait until investors and lenders start to ask them for data on their nature-related impacts and dependencies or for TNFD to become law around the world. But the opinion says that they need to start looking at this already under existing law, since some of the physical and transition risks may already be present and need to be managed regardless of whether they need to disclose those risks. Directors have duties to oversee management of risks. Investors and lenders can speed up this process and remind companies that this is already within their existing duties to investigate, even without any TNFG requirements. Secondly, although these are already material risks and that need to be investigated, the standard applicable to directors' duties under the law is highly influenced by contextual factors, such as market standards and investor opinions. Therefore, the engagement and the public pressure from the finance sector will only serve to heighten the standard that's applicable for companies and, and directors and what a reasonable director should be doing and thinking about and the things they should be aware of when they're performing their duties. So the more that we get this market signal from the finance sector, the quicker market standards will be raised, putting directors on notice that these issues are material and arguably speeding the process. Thirdly, we've seen from the Green Finance Institute report that around half of UK nature-related risks come from overseas, or I think more. Supply chain information will be critical and may well be location-specific. I think we've talked already earlier today about the location of assets. So it's quite often difficult to obtain this without cooperation from companies. Some companies will be starting to obtain more of this information in response to, for example, EU due diligence incoming regimes and in anticipation of the TNFD. But some are probably likely to be waiting. Quite a lot of companies are probably still waiting. 
information reported by companies should add to the data that financial institutions can obtain independently so they can start to build this picture of decision useful information. And in addition to the data on their own portfolio exposures, investors are going to need companies to act to mitigate their individual risks and take advantage of opportunities, allowing them to transition to be financially successful in a nature positive economy. So by clarifying that the identification and management of these risks is relevant to directors' duties and the success of companies, this opinion should signal to companies that they need to start now in order to, to avoid liability risks. And the UK Transition Planning Task Force Nature Working Group has already published a report looking at how nature could potentially be factored into transition planning, which could catalyze further action. So all of these things together should hopefully drive companies to obtain information sooner and hopefully start to manage and mitigate the risks that they've not yet explored. So I talked about this being a UK legal opinion. Um, Whilst it's not directly applicable to the laws of other countries, it may have implications for directors of non-UK companies. So the UK opinion is the latest in a series of papers and expert opinions globally on climate and nature-related risks and directors' duties. The CCLI has published papers and independent opinions on climate risk in 11 countries and also contributed, along with the Climate Governance Initiative, to a primer on climate change and directors' duties that covers 32 countries and the EU, and which is updated annually. This body of work demonstrates that the company laws of many countries around the world require board directors to consider governance and disclosure of climate risks in the performance of their duties. And those duties are broadly similar around the world. And so this is because climate risk is material. And so now we've seen why biodiversity risk is material. So the same is likely to apply. In 2022, the CZLI published a report that explained why this is the case in relation to nature and biodiversity related risks to the extent of that materiality. So it will vary depending across the world, depending on how material it is in different jurisdictions. Our report was also followed by an independent Australian legal opinion, again, that we commissioned by expert barristers in the jurisdiction that further clarified this in the Australian context. There's sufficient commonality between the laws of different countries that many conclusions of both the UK opinion and the Australian opinion are going to very likely to be applicable to other countries. Finally, um, a separate UK opinion earlier this year, nothing to do with CCLI, found that the directors of U under the UK Companies Act, directors have a duty to ensure that company accounts present a true and fair view. And so this means including sustainability issues if they're necessary to understand a company's financial position. So this could mean that nature-related issues need to start being quantified in, in financial statements, which in turn will also help investors. All of these legal opinions and reports together could signal a significant shift in corporate governance towards greater consideration of environmental factors in decision-making. And that will hopefully have implications for how companies operate, invest, and disclose information to stakeholders. Thank you. I'm going to start by asking a few questions to Jenny and Jimena. But before I do that, maybe Rich and Sharon, you want to introduce yourselves briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Sharon Brooks, so I'm the head of the Nature Economy team at UNEP WCMC. Um, for those that know, we're, we're a biodiversity uh, nature specialist uh, organization working with the United Nations Environment Programme. Great. Um, my name is Richard Mann. I'm the Climate Risk Analytics Director at Lloyds Banking Group. Great. So I think we have a, a very good and diverse panel here to uh, help us go through interesting questions, um, which you also will get to ask some of later on. I just want to pick up uh, on what you just presented, Jenny, um, about um, directors' responsibility and liability. And in the news lately, we've seen uh, lawsuits, or at least in the past year, I guess, being brought against oil companies, and also there's in the Netherlands, there was one in Switzerland, etc. What does... Um, can, in, can directors be held individually liable at this stage in those countries? How does it look, what does it look like here? So, again, it very much depends around the world on, on the 
particular jurisdiction and the legislation in place. But for example, many of you would be aware of a case in the UK recently against Shell, the directors of Shell, which was not successful. But it, it's very complicated when investors are trying to bring an action on behalf of the company. So the fact that it wasn't successful doesn't necessarily mean that future claims won't be successful. And that there was some interesting debates actually in the legal community around that, including a former Supreme Court law lord commenting on it and, and uh, commenting on the judgment and saying that it possibly could have been judged differently. And, and also the, the barristers in our legal opinion said that it, that judgment didn't mean that nature-related risks might not be litigated similarly against directors. There's also a case in Poland at the moment against directors on climate risk. Um, and so we'll have to see what happens with that. But again, it doesn't necessarily have to be under that cause of action. There's other causes of action, for example, misrepresentation, greenwashing. So, so there, could, there could be other investor claims. The, the, it is fairly remote, the, the risk, but the risks are there. That there's also the potential for, for litigation against companies, but then where directors might be in turn held liable if, if that was to be successful. And also, it's not just a matter of um, litigation risk, it's best practice and reputational mm -hmm. risk as well. That makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, for you, Jimena, um, what are the learnings for you presented sort of fact findings, but what personally and as a team, what were your learnings um, throughout the project and what are you going to do next? What are the actual next steps? Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> We've worked on this space for um, almost two years now. So um, before we, we came up with the Green Scorpion paper published with the NGFS, and the learnings were similar. So we, we leveraged that report. A lot of what we did was co-development. So we, we did hosted a lot of workshops and bilateral meetings and calls and, and whatever it took to inform our work. So we wanted to create tools and frameworks which were um, useful for driving the the impact in the direction that we, we hope it goes to to incorporate into risk uh, financial risk frameworks and so on, um, so that we intend to keep working like that. So um, through the UKRI Integrating Finance um, Diversi Diversity Program for a Nature Positive mm -hmm. um, Economy, um, we will carry on working on this space for two years. Um, Nicola Ranger. Um, will be leading this flagship on green finance for nature. So we will um, expand a bit, not just risk, we also want to work around opportunities and say developing nature transition pathways, um, nature positive, sorry, transition pathways, and as well as um, working on um, disclosures and understanding the role of um, ESG data and how company earnings reports uh, could um, provide useful information and uh, what to do with that useful information. And last but not least, also in stewardship. So we will um, expand a bit on, on the work, mm -hmm. but at the core, co-development has really worked well for us. Yeah. Great, thank you. I uh, wonder if I could um, take the conversation to you now, Sharon. Um, so you represent an institution which has perhaps worked on the issue of nature data the longest, or at least one of them, yes? Um, so, from your perspective, and I know you contributed to the report that Jimena uh, presented to us, what are your observations on, well, listening to her, knowing the outcome of the findings, um, um, and sort of your reflections on that, on the data, um, both yeah, going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, we've been working on, we, we, as an organization, we work a lot on biodiversity data, nature-related data. And, you know, I've been working there with, looking on with the private sector primarily for the past sort of 15 years, and we've seen this kind of growth in demand that's coming from the private sector as a whole, but particularly, I would say, in the last five years from the financial sector. So this awareness that this is material, this is not just about protecting nature for nature's sake. This is because it really does matter to our economy. It matters to the financial performance of institutions has really been hitting home. And I would say one of the key things that has really gained that recognition is that dependencies argument, which is where things kind of differ, I guess, from the, um, how, we, you know, how we've been, I think, harping on about impacts, let's say, for decades and not necessarily getting the, the traction that we've needed. 
but the understanding of exactly what dependencies look like and how that manifests as risk has really been growing. Um, so one of the tools that was, was used to kind of underpin that study and has been helping build this engagement with the finance sector is the Encore tool. So that's on, a, get the acronym right, Exploring Natural Capital Opportunities, Risk and Exposure. Um, so this, is, this was a tool that was developed um, to help institutions, uh, initially with financial institutions, to understand what is their potential exposure to nature-related risks and opportunities based on what their activities are, where is the finance going, what are the activities, and therefore how does that impact on nature? How does it impact on the different elements of natural capital? And how does, their, and how does it depend on ecosystem services and therefore the nature that is driving, the, the delivering those services? So it allows you to kind of go in with a really, with very little information to kind of say, just based on what we finance or what kind of what wh where the money is going, where are the risks? Where where do we need to worry? And it gives you that kind of springboard from which to then go into more further work with much greater data analytics to help you understand. But we've certainly seen that kind of growth in uptake of that in the, um, in the last yeah five years or so. And, and I think I think we're one of the users <laughs> of that. In fact, so. Um, we have used the Encore tool at Lloyds Banking Group. In, in fact, uh, an ex-colleague of yours now runs our head of, as a head of nature for Lloyds Banking Group. So the Encore tool, as you say, is incredibly helpful. Um, I, I, I completely agree with your comment around dependencies haven't really been viewed as important up until recently, but just clearly they are. Um, but it's really helped us understand both the impacts and the dependencies across our book, consumer and commercial. And it's been, it's been very, very helpful. So thank you. Great. Good to hear. So since um, you started, um, maybe you can continue. I was going to ask you about you, the, you on the user side here. So we're all very keen to understand um, you know, what you see as the main challenges uh, in terms of the data that exists now, even in terms of onboard applicability to an institution. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's similar with climate. Um, you, you can start with kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. If you don't have the data, it's hard to really understand where we are. Um, the Encore tool, it is great, um, but it's a global tool. Um, and we know with, with, with climate, but particularly with nature, location is so very important. Um, so, so it's really how do we get that data that in, the, in the kind of localities. It's, it's, it's not a regional thing. It's not even a 50 kilometer square thing. It's the asset. We want to understand its, its environment. Um, so one of the things we're doing about that, you know, partnered with the um, Soil Association with them, we, we, we built um, a tool called the Soil Association Exchange. Two versions serve as a paid for version, which includes kind of consultancies coming uh, and, and, and a free version. But the, the Soil Association Exchange is a tool for farmers where they can have consultants come to their farm and really measure uh, and understand impacts and dependencies and what they can do about it to, to, to reduce their impact, but also to protect the dependencies which they rely upon. Um, and you know, from that, we get data on our clients. We've put just over 1,000 um, farmers who bank with us through the program, through the um, Exchange Excel, and it, it benefits them, but it benefits us, and it really helps us with that kind of specific local uh, data. And then we can act on that. We can, we can think of different incentives. We can think of different ways to help that, the farmer in question. I mean, that's, that's, that's so important. I mean, you go back kind of four or five years ago in climate, um, and which is kind of, which maybe then was at a similar stage nature as now, um, looking at farms, there was, you know, certain kind of farm is bad, another kind of farm is not quite so bad. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an okay starting point, but it's not, we need much more than that. What about, um, does this, I know that Encore is being updated, it's going to be launched soon. Is that, do you tackle these, some of the spatial aspects there, or is that? So, I mean, Encore is a tool, as, as mentioned, it, it's, it's a screening tool. It works at the general level. So in, its, in terms of the knowledge base behind Encore, this gives you materiality ratings based on what the activity is and what it's likely to be depending or impacting. In itself, is not spatial, right? It, it does now, in the new version that will be coming out 
starting to be released over the summer into the autumn when the full functioning database will be available, it goes into a lot more detail, giving you down to what kind of ecosystem delivers that kind of service. It gives you the value chain links. We've heard a lot about supply chains that, so that we can start to understand where those dependencies and impacts sit further, a couple of tiers down from the activity in question. So it gives you that further detail, but what's important is to then be able to take that Encore data, take the output of Encore, and then bring in the spatial elements. You can then say, then you need to kind of say, right, this is my starting point. It helps you to know where to go and gather that information. Where do you need to get spatial data that you can then bring against other data sets? So one of the data sets, for example, you can access some data sets through it, but it, so, for example, if you, if you think about your dependencies, what's really important to know about your dependencies is, you know, how reliant are you on that ecosystem service, right? How much are you using? But also, how resilient is that ecosystem service? Is it declining? Or is, do you need to worry about that dependency or not? So then you can then go and use things like the natural capital depletion layer, which will then tell you whether or not water is actually being depleted in the area that you've got a high dependence on water. So you can start to then drill into whether or not that is indeed a dependency-related risk. Equally with impacts, we know that pressures exerted in one ecosystem are totally different to pressures exerted in another ecosystem. So it totally matters where that impact is occurring in order to actually understand whether or not it's having a magnitude of effect on ecosystems, on species, um, and how significant that is. Is it likely to actually affect critically endangered species or ecosystem services are really important to indigenous people, local communities. So you cannot understand the outputs of Encore without then bringing in your layer of where you're located, which speaks to that question of the, the huge importance of getting location asset data. And I think one of the things that we often hear a lot about is we don't have data, we can't act because we don't have data. And, and that's, I feel like that it's always a bit well, what data are we lacking? Mm -hmm. We have state of nature data in many, many places. We can always do more, but what we're often lacking is the asset level data to actually be contextualizing that information so you can actually understand impacts and you can understand dependencies. So yes, updates are coming. It's still gonna be a screening mm -hmm. tool in summary. We need <laughs> further analytics underpinning it. Makes me think about the discussions in the session before lunch. I also had some discussions with people uh, during the breaks about data versus reusing the data. So I mean, how much is that of a challenge? I imagine that maybe an institution, like financial institutions, they're still struggling with understanding climate change and how to put that through their systems and their assessment tools. I imagine that nature is, is it a bit just like, okay, climate plus nature, we just do the same thing, or is it, is it a struggle? The, the how to use the data, not just... I'm not entirely sure I can answer the question fully at the moment because we're still getting through it. Um, there are definitely overlaps and parallels. So I think a lot of banks have uh, a function like ours, a, a, a climate analytics function. I can well see them becoming an environmental analytics function mm -hmm. uh, because you know the, the two go hand in hand in many ways. Um, so I think there are commonalities, certainly. Um, I, I think nature probably has some of the same issues, but, but magnified. Uh, with climate, you're, you're, you know, it's not quite as simple as this, but you're, you're looking at your carbon dioxide equivalent. Mm -hmm. You can pretty much describe a, a lot of climate by that one metric. Mm -hmm. you, you can't do that with nature. There are so many different things to measure. And, and therein lies the, the kind of the problem. Um, a lot of banks, we do, have carbon dioxide um, targets, you know, reduction of financed emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all the sectors produce carbon dioxide equivalent, and, and so you can, you can measure all of them and you have a group measure and, and, that, and it's, it's nice and neat. You tie it off with a bow and it's a lovely target. N nature, what do you do? Do you, we, we've got a, a partnership with Woodland Trust and we're gonna plant 10 million trees over 10 years. Is that enough on its own? Probably not. You know, should we be counting the number of bees? Should we be counting, you know, it's, it, where, where, do you, where do you start, where do you stop? So I think, you know, tools like Concor are so helpful because it actually puts a framework around, and it starts, you start having commonalities. Um, so I, I think nature's gonna be a tougher nut to crack, if I can use that term. Um, but, but it's, it's in some respects, they're, they are, they are, I don't know, two sides of the coin, I'm not quite sure how to put it, but it's, it's, you, wanna, you wanna think of systems thinking, you wanna think about the environment. 
and climate and nature are, are two parts of that. How about um, when it comes back to your presentation and thinking of direct reliability, how does data play a role with that? How do you see the connections to data and analytics when it comes to so, so there's two angles to this. One is that if the companies and the financial institutions aren't getting the data, it doesn't mean that other people won't. So we now have litigants looking at satellite data and, for example, combining it with publicly available data on land ownership um, to, to make complaints, for example, in France against banks about their financing of meat that has been um, cattle from deforested land in South America. So if... if doesn't mean if the companies aren't doing it and, and the financial institutions aren't doing it, then they actually should think about who else might be doing it first. Um, and even so that even though there are difficulties with location-specific data, it proves that it can actually be done. So, so that might um, kind of be a catalyst for directors to kind of sit up and pay attention. Um, the, the other element here is just to to remember that this is active consideration. You know, to meet the bar of the, of fulfilling your duties as a director, it's not good enough not to actively consider these things. And so you can't just say, oh, well, I didn't know. The, the data wasn't there. We've seen there's enough data. There's enough tools. There's, if you go on the TNFD tools section, there's, a, there's so many tools. I mean, if I was a director, I have to confess, I wouldn't know where to start. But there is a lot of advice out there as well. There's plenty of experts civil society, society organisations, um, profit-making organisations ready to give advice on this. So there's absolutely no excuse that there isn't enough data because there's enough to get started with. And I think particularly coming back to this duty to promote the success of the company, it's not just a compliance thing. It's not just a risk thing. It's also an opportunity thing. It, directors need to be thinking about the long-term success of their company and how to transition to, to a nature-positive future. And without the data about their impacts and dependencies, how can they see what the future is for their company? How can they see where their business models could be stranded? How can they see where they could pivot their business to a better, more successful, profitable alternative? They can't possibly be complying with their duties to promote the success of their company unless they're looking at, at this stuff, really. I agree. Great. Um, did you want to comment? No, I just no. agree. I <laughs> agree with that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all of you a question if you have a uh, view on that. So how do we take this issue to the next level? And I'm thinking particularly about are there, um, would you like regulation? Would you like policy? What would you expect uh, the government to do? Is Would that be helpful at all? What, what can we expect? Or what would you like to see? Either anybody can go in terms of using or... I mean, I think um, regulating for TNFD to disclosures to become law is the obvious one, but we, we've seen today how there are limitations with that. I, I'd also like to see more investigation of this issue of, of disclosure within financial statements, because I think once... I think we were talking a lot about pricing and risk earlier in one of the earlier panels, but if you could start pricing this in, these externalities in at the company level within financial accounts and, and what that actually means for the profit, for profitability of their companies. You know, once they start accounting for these dependencies within their business models, within their actual numbers, then that should hopefully drive better awareness of this. And I think that needs more, maybe not regulatory action, but kind of more guidance for example, from the IFRS and the international bodies. Yeah, the, the idea of valuing natural capital is, 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 is a great one because then you're putting it into the same kind of profit and loss decision-making um, scheme. So I'd, 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 I would agree with that. I mean, your, your comment around TNFD, TCFD was very, very helpful. And I think TNFD will, will be similar, is what I'd say. It's just, I mean, one of the things that I reflect on from this morning to start a discussion as well is around, you know, that we've got lots of different frameworks and standards at the moment, which is making, you know, it's creating these challenges with actually implementation and getting to action because we need to make sure that, you know, we don't just get caught up in a kind of assessment and disclosure loop where we're never actually getting to changing anything on the ground. So the, I think from a regulatory perspective, this kind of alignment piece is going to be really, really important. So how do we build off what we already have and we create more alignment in that space? But also for the, I think there is, coming back to the kind of data and analytics that needs to underpin 
what I would say, meaningful disclosure that actually reflects actual performance to enable you to reward good performance as well as penalize poor performance, not just from a risk perspective, but from a how is that risk actually being managed. It was spoken about this morning in response to climate, and it's absolutely the case with nature. We don't want to be in a place where we're just incentivizing people to move away from the problem. Mm. We need to be able to incentivize actors to address the problem in those locations. So we need the information to be meaningful. And I think what connects into the, the sort of public sector role, if you like, is also that is around the generation of, you know, through things like the NBSAT process, these are the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans that would be developed by countries to develop their own priorities, to develop, to bring that kind of public data sets on, on ecosystem assets within jurisdictions to support the disclosure, to support, so it's trying to drive that kind of more bottom-up understanding of what's actually happening on the, under the ground rather than just this kind of top-down view of risk, if you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. I think that there's a really important role for the public sector to help that. I would add, <clears throat> aside from regulation, which I hope we showed that a nature-related financial risk is uh, within a central bank mandate to the UK, so uh, mindful that it's an election year and so on, but also building capacity in financial institutions and being aware that complexity is not going to vanish because nature is more complex than climate and so on, so you're not going to have a, a metric that can simplify everything, but still, there's a lot that you can do. So in our report, we didn't have subnational sub level data, I and mean, it's something that we would be super helpful to do, but still we managed to create, I think, a lot of um, tools and way forward despite the data issues. So being mindful of that, there are ways around it that you can work. You cannot wait for the perfect because of mm. it, just doing that, the delay is unhelpful. Great. Okay. I think I'd like to open the floor to um, questions. And I see you already have one. I think this is a question for Jen. I was very interested in what you were saying about direct responsibility, but my mind took it down a very slightly different but well-known path. So considering how the company responded, I'll say a certain oil company. Okay. So when the shareholder group brought a resolution to the shareholder meeting challenging them on climate, the board's response, so the director's response, was to sue the shareholder group, in other words, their owners, uh, for bringing that motion. I believe, though, it was settled slightly differently. As they initially sued, it, it wasn't just to get them to stop, it actually put some kind of punitive damages for them as well, because obviously that was their objective. Now, that's an example of the directors um, actively, let's say we've got the active words in there, doing the reverse of properly um, so, obviously, there's a question there about how that relates to your understanding of the war and stuff you've been talking about. But clearly, as in the US, or Holland, I think, as well, it didn't stop them. Would it be possible, as a policy action, for the UK to actually enact legislation to make such action impossible? Oh, that, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I'm not sure I know the answer. <laughs> um, I mean, Going back to this possibility to sue either way, and we're seeing that in the US, I think there's a case against the US pension fund as well, for, against um, ESG action. And that because um, fiduciaries, you know, directors or investors have to balance all of the competing interests, including profitability, including climate and biodiversity, there's always that nuance. And, and one of the bars in, in, in the case against Shell was the fact that the court does not see it proper to get involved in this balancing act. And so I think for that reason, legislators would similarly be a little bit averse to kind of wading in there and actually controlling this more because it's seen that, that only the directors, you know, it's so context specific and fact specific that it's, you can't kind of substitute your decision for what the directors should have done to a certain extent, and, and you know there are nuances there, and I think there, there was kind of a debate in the Shell case about what was 
consensus best practice methodology. And I think a lot of us in this room would say there is enough consensus best practice methodology to say that they should have followed it, but the judge didn't think so. So I think it depends on your legislators. <laughs> um, and I think it depends on, on yeah, this view of you know, what place is it of, of a judge or a legislator to kind of get involved to that extent with the running of the company? And historically, unfortunately, it's been seen that, that you know, it, it should be hands off, you know, that companies should be able to get on with their money making activities without too much um, legislation. I'm not saying I agree with that, <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of answered it. Can I, can I just come in on that one? Because I think the case you're talking about when the oil company um, is Exxon, well, Exxon, right? Is that who you're talking about? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Exxon actually sued the shareholders and the basis for their um, claim against their shareholders is actually that the SEC rules, so the guidance around um, shareholder activism in the states, um, it's allowing shareholders to um, kind of uh, micromanage the company and it was saying that the shareholder resolution wasn't tabled in good faith and it was actually trying to disrupt the, um, the main business of the uh, company. Um, it's thrown up really, really interesting issues in the shareholder space because um, to non-activist <coughs> non shareholders, so the, the um, a Scandinavian uh, sovereign oil fund and then one of the largest US pension funds in, in the States, they both came out and said that they were going to um, vote against the re-election of certain uh, Exxon Mobil shareholders at the AGM. So it's, it's really thrown up lots of issues in the shareholder space. The AGM happened last week and the, uh, the, share, the directors were 95% um, voted in, in again, so that really quelled the shareholder rebellion. But the claim is continuing. Um, specifically for the reason that you've, you've touched on in terms of uh, legislation and regulation around shareholder activism. So I think if you keep an eye on that case, there'll be some, some kind of more concrete answers to your questions about whether this can be regulated. Um, yeah. So certainly also in the context of the directors, I mean, this is the reverse of, I mean, I know it's the US government, but, um, but this is the reverse of the director responsibility and efficiency learning. Those kind of things is kind of unresponsibility. Yeah. Which is what the makes the quite Absolutely. Any other questions um, relating to data? And also, I mean, courtroom drama, I think, is more exciting maybe than data, but let's have a question on data. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this is rather more prosaic question. Uh, again, for Jenny. Sorry, Claire Bedanis from Baldwin Windsor. I said this morning when I asked the question about requirements on companies who are reporting things um, you advise companies and help them help them report. So my question, Jenny, was if companies under the duty you're talking about, sorry, if directors have a liability at the moment, even though they aren't required to report on it, should sort of by advice on reporting requirements, nonetheless should they be reporting on it anyway under company rule? To a certain extent, some companies, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, the barristers, in our legal opinion, looked at this, um, and there are certain listed companies that already have to, un under existing legislation, have to report material environmental con con issues that are material. So, so to that extent, that it's, the legislation is already there. Um, I think if it's something that's not required by existing law, then maybe officially they don't have to disclose it, but it's certainly something they should be thinking about disclosing, because otherwise they, they may open themselves up to, to claims for, for kind of misrepresentation and misstatement of the company's value. Again, it depends on the specifics, um, but yeah. And can I just say thank you to Susan as climate lawyer for answering the previous question and, and helping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that answers the, the question. It's, it's very company specific, and take advice, I think, is, is the answer. <coughs> More questions? Thank you. Yeah, a question, and thank you earlier for the references to, to the Encore tool. Um, the question that I have for, for anyone or everyone is, um, when you mentioned Encore breaking down risks and dependencies, um, I'm, I'm still seeing a need and interest in stakeholders to talk about biodiversity sort of overall and, and as a headline. Um, could you 
give any advice for companies in thinking about that under sort of the nature, sort of headline or umbrella, and, and how you might approach that? Yep, I can speak to that. Um, I mean, I would say that when, we, when the way that we're looking at, you know, biodiversity is sort of the living component of nature. So obviously, nature has a slightly broader remit, and, and including, of course, climate, right? But biodiversity is kind of underpinning many of those nature services, right? So it's very integral to how we would look at, if you were to try to understand an impact on natural capital, we would, want, we would be looking at biodiversity values of looking at ecosystem extent conditions, species extinction risks, understanding ecosystem service delivered by ecosystems. So it becomes very integral to how we look at those services on, upon which companies are depending, and of course the way in which companies are impacting on nature. So it's kind of, yeah, threaded throughout, I would say. I mean, one of the things that's quite important is if you're trying to understand, even through water, as you know, there's a lot that happens around sort of fresh water, but we know, of course, you know, the, the, the ecosystems that we need to support and, and protect to be able to maintain those hydrological services and be able to ensure a future provision of water starts to get into um, understanding um, elements of biodiversity in the, within those ecosystems. So even for things that are not obviously about biodiversity, they are underpinning it, so it becomes very integral to how we understand it. So if I, I could add, there's this non-substitutability to biodiversity and ecosystem services, and maybe that's a hard concept to grasp if you're coming from a financial institution perspective, that you can somehow move your location. And in some cases, on a one on you might, but not you cannot divest yourself from this issue at hand either. So being aware of that, um, and also how things could change in the future, when, under different scenarios and so on, what's happening now would be different than in the future, and trying to manage all that complexity um, as well. I think we're almost, um, I think we're, unfortunately, we are with one more minute before. Is it a short question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Um, on, on the question of biodiversity, I also want to say, I mean, this is a hugely interesting and I think um, evolving topic. So. The science community, they have been discussing this for decades, what the right measures would be, and then you throw in the rest of us, so the financial sector, etc. And so it's all, I think, um, there's a lot of good ideas brewing, um, a lot of work to be done. Um, I'm sure we'll uh, get to some sort of um, uh, working measure that we can work on uh, in the medium term. And that sort of brings me back to um, want to close the session. Um, and I think the question asked um, in this type of session made a good point because it says, um, are the data analytics good enough? And I think it was very much a loaded question. So in the sense that we're probably supposed to say, and I would probably agree with that, um, that um, we're not there yet. We certainly are much better in a much better situation than we were some years ago in terms of having the tools. But uh, we are, it's, it's, a, it's a process that we need to, we just need to become better at it. And we're not going to settle um, for mediocrity, but on the other hand, it's possible to try and then you pivot and you move in a new direction. Um, other people before lunch also uh, alluded to the fact that sometimes it's a convenient excuse to blame the lack of data and analytics. Um, it's a good reason for not doing anything. So again, many good reasons for trying to do something as long as we don't lock it into a system where, where we cannot move from, but I don't think that will happen. Um, I just a couple of other things that I picked up from the panel. Uh, I think the, the whole issue of the supply chain, we haven't had time to talk about that and how much of that uh, in your findings and also reflected in some of the others' comments comes from the supply chain and it made me think of the whole carbon discussion in scope three. This is in a way the equivalent of that. So obviously that exists in nature too and maybe we're just starting to understand how important that is. Um, I like Jen's point about data, but even if we don't know it, or if I don't know as a director about something, it doesn't mean someone else doesn't know. So, you know, and some of these tools are very much uh, democratizing tools, and that somebody will get a hold of it and can, um, uh, the power will be then be in the hands of someone else. Anyway, there were many other interesting um, discussions that were had. Um, I want to thank my panel very much, um, and thank you for good questions. And yes, thank you. <laughs>